Hello, this is the Green Corn Rebellion Show. I'm Gregory Harden II, and today I am here with Nathan J. Robinson, who is the editor and founder of Current Affairs Magazine. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm so well. Nice to be with you. Yeah, uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, one of my favorite people on the online left, uh, bringing some sanity to my Twitter feed from time to time. <laughs> um, Whoa, 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 stop what you're doing. Okay, if you like this video and you like the other content on my channel, please hit the like button on this video. Also, go hit subscribe, like right now. And also, when you hit subscribe, click the bell so you can get notifications whenever I put out a new video. So, thanks. All right, enjoy the rest of the video. But yeah, uh, first question I have here is where are you from and where did you grow up? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, 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 well, it's not that complicated, but I, I never know quite where I'm from. I mean, I was born in the UK, so I was born in um, uh, Stevenage, England, and I came here to the United States when I was five years old. I grew up mostly in Sarasota, Florida. I consider that to be where I'm from, but if I say that I'm from Sarasota, Florida, people wonder why I have weird accent. I've been accused of faking an accent before, just state on the record, once and for all. I don't have a fake accent. I have a weird hybrid English-American accent from the fact that uh, my parents are British and I was born there. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I, I grew up in Florida, and then I went to... Um, Massachusetts for college at Brandeis and I sort of stayed in New England for uh, 10 years and then I moved where I am now which is uh, where Carter Fraser is based which is New Orleans Louisiana my favorite city in the world um, and I've been here for four years running this magazine was there a second part to the question I can't remember I feel like oh, I didn't that was pretty much it did um, I cover it okay. yeah where you're from and where did you grow up yeah because yeah. like I thought until i read read your wikipedia page i thought you like grew up in the uk and came to america for college i had no idea that you no. had been in america your entire I'm an american. life yeah Not american well i have to i have i have two passports i have a british passport but um you know my memories of england are, are very faint um I, I yeah, my Wikipedia entry has uh, is full of lies, but um, uh, that that part is true. I did grow up in the United States, and uh, I, I, I it's 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 odd how I don't know why I sound so English. I think I was just a stubborn child who didn't like, who didn't want to conform or assimilate, and so the accent that I had when I was five years old and I came here and I was speaking, uh, I just never could completely lost. So. I, I do. I kind of hate my my voice um, because it just raises so many questions. Why why I sound that way? But I'm I seem to be stuck with this uh, with this strange accent. Yeah, because like because that's what I thought like made sense to me. It was like, oh okay, that kind of makes sense why his accent is like so like kind of weird ish. Because he grew up in the UK, but then he came to America, so his accent changed. But no, like that's no. that's interesting though. No, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. If you um, think it makes sense, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> especially Florida, because I'm sure I don't know specifically where sir the town the is, but like, is it one of the more northern parts of Florida? It's a uh, Gulf it's Coast. South? It's uh, oh, okay. south of Tampa. Um, okay. But the thing is, I mean, the real explanation is that I spent a lot of time. I was the only child. I spent a lot of time around my parents, and my parents are very, very oh, British, okay. very British accents. So, um, some children uh, switch between. Uh, when they're with their parents, they, they're British, and when they're with their peers, they're American. But I, I think I had contempt for my peers. So, uh, <laughs> for people in Florida, you mean, as everyone for, does. I yeah. like no. I had I'm many kidding. friends, but I didn't want to sound like them. So I, I stayed. I do actually sound more English with my. If I was speaking with my parents, you would find that I became suddenly slightly more English, but uh, and then I would slip back into some Americanizations when I'm with Americans. That's interesting. That's that's very interesting. All right. Episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion show are sponsored by Oklahoma Progress Now. Oklahoma Progress Now is a 501c4 organization focused on building progressive power in Oklahoma. 
Their primary efforts are on developing progressive content for a 21st century audience, coalition, and capacity building across progressive organizations and causes, and working to see elected leaders who are more responsive to their constituents and the needs of the many. Areas of focus include progressive messaging and communications, coalition building and resource sharing, and focused progressive policy goals. You can check out their Twitch live streams, and they go uh, live on Facebook on at noon, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please support this organization. It's a really great organization. It's just getting started here in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the video. Um, so while you were growing up, what influenced your politics? Like, were you always into politics when you were younger, or was that like a relatively you know, I, like, yeah? I, 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 I mean, no offense to you, but I hate this question. And one of the reasons, the reasons I hate, the reason I hate, it's not the only time I've been asked it. And I understand why people want to ask it, but I don't actually know the answer. I feel like every answer I could give is a little bit self-serving because, or or made up because I can't remember how exactly I became political like i know that by the time i was in ninth grade i was in the in the debate club and i know that i i remember like some of my early opinions on things i remember that i had a i had a friend who was in the grade above me who was very political always and i think influenced me a lot and like gave me books by noam chomsky and like uh you know we we were on the debate team together and i'm sure that he he influenced me a great deal and I remember one of the earliest things though was like, I, I remember being weirded out. So I went to a public school in Sarasota and, but it is a, it is a public school that is, it's a magnet school that basically they take the students that they think have some potential away from the normal public school system and they put them in the good, they get them the good public school. You get the good yeah. public school. Um, and everyone else gets the shitty public schools. Uh, they're not that bad, but they, you know, uh, and, and, th but the thing is that it's a really discomfortingly like racist and classist place. And I noticed like one of the things that became obvious was like, Sarasota is not a completely white place, but the school I went to was almost completely white and also was all the children of local doctors and lawyers. And they were pretty infamous for like paying private psychologists to do the IQ test that would get you into the, to the magnet school. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, fairly early on being quite conscious of this and finding it unpleasant and disturbing. And I, so I remember my school, I liked my school in many ways, but I, you know, and I can't take credit for this myself because I know this was pointed out to me by other people. And I remember sort of, it's starting to develop an awareness of, of injustice at an early age. And also Sarasota is another, and the other thing is there's all these fights over homelessness in Sarasota where um, you know, it's a tourist town and it, because we don't want the tourists to see that some people don't have houses, um, the, there were all these clashes between the police and, and homeless people. And every time, um, you, you know, and then they move them to a place that would then be gentrified, then they move them to another place. And it, it was really brutal and really, um, horrible. And, uh, and so seeing those things, the, I, I think I read about in the, why you should be a socialist book, you know, that most leftists are, are sort of made not by theory, but by the observation of everyday injustice somewhere in their lives and, and becoming conscious of it as an injustice and, and as not quite right. And so growing up in Sarasota, I do remember seeing things that became disturbing or became not quite right, but I don't, I can't explain why I began to feel feel that those things were disturbing and other people didn't all right um that's an interesting answer um yeah super well you must have had do you do you remember like experiences or do you remember the moment where you became like politicized yeah like uh for me it was like let's see so the first thing i remember was uh 2002 when i was four we had a uh 
the, our state senator at the time, uh, Brad Henry, who was from my hometown of Shawnee, he was running for governor. And my parents told me, you know, he's a Democrat, we're Democrats, we're voting for him, blah, blah, blah. That's like the first thing I remember. And then um, I remember disliking George Bush because yeah. of the Iraq war and like watching CNN and seeing, you know, they used to have the, uh, on the situation room with Wolf Blitzer. This is like whenever that show first started, Yeah, <laughs> like they would show the death count for the troops in uh, Iraq after it started. And eventually after it got to like 3,000 or 4,000, they stopped showing the count every day. Um, but I remember that. And, mm. you know, those were, and then I remember the 04 election. Um, my parents voted for John Edwards in the primary. Um, then John Edwards ended up being the VP to John Kerry. Right. Um, then John Kerry lost. Uh, I remember being very disappointed and sad about John Kerry losing that election, even though I was just six years old. <laughs> but that was like the first like yeah. few things I remember. And, you know, the 08 election, I followed a little bit more closely because uh, Obama and I really wanted Obama to win and then was disappointed by Obama after he won. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. I was... I was always kind of like aware and kind of caring about it and knowing about it. Um, but like <clears throat> what made me get actually active for, I can't really say what made me get active, mm. but like, I remember when I got active, it was like in like my senior year, I started a young Democrats group at my high mm. school and I had decided my junior year that I wanted to become a history teacher and then that summer I decided I wanted to go into politics one day too and yeah like I always was always aware and then eventually got active and now I'm running for office and now I have the yep. show and the show's existed for a little over two years so yeah but yeah but that was it's kind of a combination of things it was, right yeah it I mean, the reason I, I, I said to you that I you know, hate the question, I don't hate the question, but I think it's a difficult question because I, I think so many of us don't really know exactly the, the mysterious combination of factors that politicize us. I mean, we can isolate feelings that we had, emotions that we had at particular points in our life. We can remember when we were 11 years old and we watched an election and we knew what our loyalties were, but the factors that drove us to have a certain set of politics, uh, and we can remember a book we read perhaps that illuminated something for us or you know a thing we saw that really outraged us. Um, but the answer to how your politics develop is, um, is, is really, really different. Difficult. I've been interviewing DSA members all around the country for my dissertation, and I always ask them this because, you know, so I, I do ask this question myself, um, and, uh, and it's tough for people because people can remember experiences, but uh, yeah, nobody knows why they have the, 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 the politics that they do necessarily, and um, so I, I can't really answer it uh, that, that satisfyingly. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so what made you start Current Affairs? Well, that I can that I have a better answer to. That um, I was a, I was in grad school and I was um, doing a blog and um, I was basically I was very unhappy in grad school, uh, well, partially because I just felt like academic research was not useful uh, or the kind that I was doing. Well, I would never reach an, an audience, and I was very concerned. You know, I, I I was a very political person, and I wanted to produce writing that mattered. And I started doing some freelance writing for different publications, wrote for the New Republic, wrote for the Washington Post. Um, and I didn't enjoy that because I found that I couldn't write the sort of thing that I really wanted to write. And I, I had, a, in my blog, I had a very kind of distinctive voice. And every time I'd write for a publication, they would really kind of cut the heart and soul out of my pieces in the editorial process. And um, I wanted something that would be 
halfway between academic writing and what's called popular writing, you know, that would be really deep, but also would be accessible to people who didn't have graduate school educations. I wanted something that could be like fun and funny without compromising how sophisticated it was intellectually. And I had started also making these silly little kind of parody children's books that were like these, um, it's just for fun on the side, I was making these like fake satirical children's books. And so I had like three sides of my work where I was doing writing for publications, well, uh, you know, writing the, the satirical stuff and the crazy stuff and the blog stuff and then doing academic work. And I wanted to find some ways and project that could that could meet all these things in the, in the middle and really felt like it suited, you know, like, it, like it captured all those different sides of, of myself. And I also felt like there was a real market and, and real need for more left publications. I'd seen what Jacobin had done and I was really impressed by it. I, I just admired them so much, but I also thought, well, you know, Jacobin is is the is the only game in town, really, as far as left magazines go. I mean, there's in these times and the Baffler, which are a bit older. Um, and uh, I th so I thought, oh, I think we could really do something that would that would be you know, that would complement Jacobin, but be different from it. And so I tried it out in September 2015. I spent the whole month making a mock-up magazine. I just took 30 days and just on my computer, I thought, can I design something that would be professional looking? And I designed something that was satisfying enough to where I thought, you know, this, this has some potential. Maybe, maybe we should move forward with this and try and make it a real magazine. All right, um, that's interesting. Um, so how did you end up being a columnist for The Guardian? And would you like to talk about why you got fired? And why I'm no longer a columnist yes. for The Guardian. <laughs> Gosh, how did I how did I end up becoming a columnist for The Guardian? I think I just submitted pitches to them and they started accepting them and I was a sort of publishing freelance with them for a while just here and there and then the editor there liked me a lot because I, I produced I, I, I'm pretty good at writing stuff quickly and um, and she found that uh, she could come up with a topic that they needed a piece on and I was a really good kind of go-to person who could turn around 800 words that was relatively publishable pretty fast and so, you know, she started using me more and more when they needed pieces on different topics. And then eventually they said, she said, could you, you know, would you like a columnist position? And it comes with a bit of a pay raise. Um, and so I did that for, I can't remember how long I was a columnist for, about a year maybe. And um, then, uh, and it, 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 it was great. I, 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 uh, I had a good relationship with the editor there. Uh, my pieces were reasonably widely read. I, I was, um, you know, not their most successful columnist, but I was not an unsuccessful columnist. Um, but in February, no, I mean, no, it was before February because I sent the tweet. I, so I sent a tweet. This is why you should never tweet. Um, but I sent a tweet. Uh, it, it, you know, Congress had just approved some vast new appropriation for Israeli weapons systems. And I wrote something i think I, I think what i said was i think they included it with the latest round of covid relief they added added or they'd done it at the same time even as they were sort of scaling back their ambitions on covid relief they'd given some colossal sum of money to israel for a new weapon system and i sent a tweet saying uh did you know that it's actually the US law that you're not allowed to pass any new spending without also including a new weapons system for Israel? This was a joke. And I, in case anyone didn't know it was a joke, I included a second tweet that said, okay, not really, that's a joke, but it's such common practice that it might as well be the law. Yeah. I got an email from the editor-in-chief of The Guardian later that day. So there were some replies uh, uh, calling me an anti-Semite, and I just ignored them because that's stupid. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then I got an email from the editor-in-chief of The Guardian later that day, who's a man I, I had no idea was the editor-in-chief of The Guardian. This is the first time I've, I've had an email from this man ever. 
you know, I didn't even know. I, I found out that this guy, John Mulholland, was the editor in chief of The Guardian when he emailed me. This is my boss. And I'm like, oh shit, this is my boss. I have a boss. And it's this guy. And this is an email for the boss. And, I, I, and it said something like, you know, please delete this tweet. You hold yourself out as a representative of The Guardian. This tweet has anti Semitic connotations. This tweet is fake news. Um, because it's not actually the law that you have to, <laughs> to give Israel a new weapon system every time you pass a new congressional budget appropriations bill. Um, so please delete this and apologize. And I deleted it, but I didn't apologize. I apologized to him. I didn't apologize. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't you know, want to embarrass the Guardian. I deleted the tweet. I said this like a coward. And my only regret is that I, I tried to appease him and deleted the tweet because I should have said, you know, eat shit. <laughs> Sorry, you can bleep that. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. You I should have enough, said, so. actually, that was the, uh, I, I, you know, I thought for a moment there about whether I should say that or something even worse. No, I should have, I, you know, I should have said, look, I, I'm sorry, but I, I'm not going to delete this, you know, and if you, and if you try and, um, make me and if there are repercussions for this i'll go public and say you're trying to censor your columnists so that's what i should have said uh, yeah. that's what I, um but i didn't i just said because uh, because i looked at it i looked at it and i wasn't even particularly proud of the tweet I thought, that's a stupid joke i was like do i really want to die on the hill of this joke so i deleted the tweet because i also realized that i was earning I was not earning much as a columnist i was earning like twelve thousand dollars a year um as a columnist uh because and uh it was a side gig and yeah. uh I don't want to. I don't want to die on this hill. So I said that, and I said, "Oh, so sorry to do. Sorry to do fake news." And uh, anyway, then then they stopped accepting my columns. It just, just sort of. I would email my editor with a new column idea, and I wouldn't hear back. Or there'd be these excuses, and it was weird. And then uh, she said, "I would like to publish you again, but I need to talk to Mulholland before I publish you again." So she had a meeting with Mulholland, and then she called me afterwards, and she said, "I'm sorry, but." Um, he doesn't want you to be a columnist anymore. And I said, this is about the tweet? She's like, yeah, it's about the tweet. And she's like, and he also says we want to move in a different direction. And I'm like, it's about the tweet. And she's like, he, well, the tweet, I was like, I apologize for the tweet. She's like, he doesn't want you to be a columnist anymore. So, I mean, that's that's how it happened. I was just it's kind of shocked. It's just a brazen act of censorship on the part of the Guardian over a clearly just like criticism of legitimate criticism of Israel. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was ludicrous. Yeah, it was pretty insane. Um, I think I remember you tweeting the tweet before you got fired. And I was like, yeah, that's a funny tweet. But no, um, that's... It, that was pretty insane. Um, I mean, and the thing is, it wasn't even a criticism of Israel. Not really. It, yeah, that's, it, it that, was a criticism yeah. of U.S. military. It was it was a criticism of Congress's prioritization of military aid to Israel during a pandemic where yeah. they needed to be doing more to help the American people. And, yeah. uh, and, and so it was a really mild thing to get to get canned over as a, as a columnist i mean it was crazy oh and the other thing was with that that in this email he sent me the subject line was something like confidential <laughs> and he said you know do not tell anyone that i'm basically i want to censor you but i don't want you to tell anyone that you said yeah to me. Uh, which i didn't until he fired me and then i was like well that's not a rule like yeah. i can tell people yeah that's crazy. Um, so do um, so do you keep up with or follow uh, politics in the UK? A little bit. I mean, I wrote about um, I, I I wrote about the two US uh, UK elections um, where Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the Labour Party, was running. I've drifted away from UK politics recently, but. Um, yeah, when 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 Corbyn became the head of the Labour Party, I did write about it um, uh, a fair amount, um, but I, I haven't done so probably for probably haven't written anything at UK politics in two years. Um, it, it, one of the reasons for that, unfortunately, is that uh, 
we have a US audience and they're not interested in British politics. So when we write about British politics, no one reads the articles. So yeah. it's, a, it's not a great investment to, of our time. I would like to expand our presence in Britain, but that would require, you know, we need to get some British writers and some attention in Britain somehow. And they really are two very different media ecosystems, right? I mean, the Britain, it's weird, actually. Like there are tons of British celebrities that nobody in America has ever heard of um, because they, they just, it's, it's a very different country in terms of its in terms of its media. They're thinking about talking about different things. I mean, British people pay attention to American politics, but Americans just do not pay attention to anything in Britain. Yeah, um, yeah um, I've been following UK politics for a while too. Like, I think the first UK politics thing I remember following was the Scottish referendum. Oh yeah, in twenty fourteen. And <clears throat> I kind of followed the 2015 election, uh, not that closely, but I kind of did. And Corbyn's election uh, to labor leader in 2015 that summer, I followed that quite a bit. And then um, what was it? The Brexit election, and then 2017, 2019. Um, I actually, my senior year of high school, I wrote a paper uh, for my senior project that was about the history of the UK Labour Party, more specifically oh, okay. the part like uh, the neoliberal turn um, after um, Michael Foote's loss oh, in yeah. 83. So I wrote about that. And yeah, yeah you know got to shit talk tony blair okay i didn't shit talk that's tony Blair, but like i got to talk <laughs> about that and um i did that for my um paper i haven't read that paper in a while i need to bring it back up so yeah, like yeah. a handful of pa pages but i thought it was pretty cool but like i'm yeah. pretty familiar with like you know uk politics on some level at least more than your average american is right um, the history of the late labor party is pretty interesting um there's a lot of analogous things to the democratic party here in america maybe not a lot but like on some no yeah i mean it's in right some ways it is yeah although you know the difference being that the labor party founded as an explicitly socialist party and so yeah. drifted away from its roots i mean i i uh i've written about the the founding of the nhs um uh, a couple of times actually which i find fascinating i mean one of the interesting historical moments that I think is worth learning from is after World War II when the British voters, even after Winston Churchill is credited with the leadership that wins Britain World War II, British voters immediately after the end of the war kick out Churchill and the Conservative Party and vote in the Socialist Labour Party um, because the Labour Party has succeeded in creating an understanding that a more socialist society is what people deserve after the war is over. And they introduce the, and they introduce the NHS and the, and the modern welfare state. And of course, it just becomes hugely popular, so popular that now even conservative politicians can't bash the NHS. Everyone has to pledge their allegiance to the NHS in Britain because it's so beloved, their free healthcare. Um, and this is a real example of what a a socialist party that is serious about its principles can can do. I mean, Britain was a country that had a rigid class system uh, that was very, very brutal, right? I mean, of course, all of Karl Marx's uh, examples of the worst horrors of capitalism are drawn from his observations of Britain. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so it was a it was it was the it was the worst kind of industrial capitalist society where just people were, were just destroyed and, and ruled over by these horrible aristocrats. Um, and in a country like that, you manage to have a successful workers' party that introduces a a radical um, nationalized free healthcare system, and uh, that is popular to this day. And I just think it's such an important lesson to learn. And um, uh, and it, and it's inspiring because you you think that well if if socialist politics can succeed there, um, there's no reason why they can't succeed here. Yeah. Um, uh, what else is it? Yeah. The but I find the history of the UK Labour Party kind like it's fascinating. It definitely is or UK politics in general because like I was 
a few uh, there's a couple of days during the summer where I was like reading about like what was the two parties before labor and conservatives the Whigs and yeah uh, who was it Whigs and the Tories that was them, yeah right yeah I was reading about them and like I don't know it's fascinating stuff when how actually winston churchill was a liberal at one point and was even right. like a late liberal like minister in a liberal government under a liberal prime minister. wild stuff um but no um the history of the u.s democratic party is like infinitely more fascinating to me um mm. like especially if you look at from like the let's see woodrow wilson years to like let's say i would say even if you go to like the clinton years like that whole almost 100 year history of the u.s democratic Party is like really fascinating to me mm. the different mm. types of like voter bases that it picked up uh and mm. dropped off and whatever and were able to keep all together under one tent without like imploding mm -hmm. <laughs> until you know as of recently now it's always imploding um mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah um let's see uh so what are your thoughts on the left currently in america well we're in a tough spot uh in, in obviously the bernie campaign was such a an important uh, rallying point it gave us something it gave us a, a clear mission it was something to focus on it really energized the u.s left both bernie campaigns um we i've been interviewing as a as i mentioned dsa members around the country and um you know dsa growth has stalled this year 2021 versus 2020 they were trying to reach 100 000 members they ha did not succeed yet um because and left media has been losing subscribers and followers this year um and so in many ways the story is for the for the left is discouraging we were in this moment for a while in 2019 and in the beginning of 2020 where anything felt possible it reached its peak when bernie sanders born in nevada um and it's very clear that it's you know we didn't with the didn't win the primary uh we all had to support joe biden who we despised um and that was you know humiliating and depressing and of course the biden administration has been uh in some ways better than expected but in other ways just as bad as everyone knew yeah. they would be um the republicans are probably going to seize control of congress again in uh 20 <clears throat> Uh, next year in 2022 and uh, they have a very good shot at the presidency in 2024 <clears throat> because biden is going to be extremely old and kamala harris is uh totally lacking in any uh political yeah. skill um so i it's it's extremely good and that's just keeping the democrats in power right um, yeah the question of 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 real movement towards the left i mean seems very very distant uh, th at the same time, that's a that's a depressing story. There is a, an encouraging part of the story, which is that I have found that we have a lot of victories that simply aren't reported. So there are a lot of DSA elected officials. For example, people should read the interview I did with Robert Peters, who is the state senator in Illinois, who holds Barack Obama's yeah. old state senate seat. And that is a really interesting change because obviously Barack Obama was, as we know, a neoliberal disappointment. And Robert Peters is a DSA member. He is, and he gets he gets stuff done. I mean, he passed like 13 bills in his first year that he was the lead author on. And he's changing, you know, he's getting immigration detention facilities banned in the state of Illinois. And he's doing really cool things that are important um the national press never writes about him they don't care about him i i until until i interviewed him for the current affairs podcast uh you know the national press hadn't covered him at all which was crazy to me because he's a really inspiring guy um uh his life story is is totally fascinating 
his work is really is really successful and important. Um, and he's not the only one. I've talked to other DSA state legislators around the country in New York, um, in Rhode Island, in um, uh, Maryland, I, and they are getting stuff done. And there are people on city councils. Uh, socialists took over the Somerville City Council in Massachusetts. And there are, I just interviewed um, this guy on the, uh, uh, Dean Preston on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, who was talking about uh, his efforts on affordable housing in San Francisco and how the developers despise him there. Um, he's doing great work. Um, and so the local level and in state government, there's all sorts of fantastic leftists who are reaching office and just nobody's talking about them. And when I went to the DSA convention in Atlanta in 2019, they had a session for the press where the press could meet all these DSA elected officials. And there were like 40 elected officials from around the country there. Uh, there's this woman, uh, Ruth Buffalo in, I can't remember if it's North or South Dakota, one of the Dakotas who's yeah. in the state legislature. Leg legislature. And, and she took over from the Republican who had authored the bill that was to try to disenfranchise Native Americans. And, um, uh, and she's she's a native uh, woman herself, and she kicked him out of office. Yeah, which is which is which is awesome, <laughs> right? And I didn't read about that uh, anywhere. And so there are these there are these small scale victories that are occurring all around the country because it's a vast country with thousands and thousands and thousands of elected offices. There's something like five hundred thousand elected offices in America. I mean, the the number is I can't remember what the number is. It's huge. And all of these offices have to be filled, and there are great people running for them, succeeding, pulling off things. But because we don't really have a national press, and because the national press we do have is not interested in this stuff, um, it's easy to overlook it and to think we're losing harder than we actually are. And the great mm -hmm. news is that in 20 years, all of these people are going to be in a position to reach greater power, right? I mean, Robert Peters is in the Illinois State Senate right now, but I can see Robert Peters being the Illinois senator when he's 50. Um, so we have a bench. We're building a bench. And it's got talented people, including yourself, of course, right? You, I, I think you have a future, right? And I'm really glad you're running for office because, and if you don't succeed this time, which I mean, you're going to, we're, we're going to make you, we're going to put you in office, but supposing hypothetically you didn't, you know, you, you come back and yeah. you come back learning lessons and then you, you, you knock it out of the park the next time. And, you know, over time, Life is actually quite long. Uh, unfortunately, with climate change, there's, there's real urgency to us building power. But I mean, I do think I see a lot of hope over the for the for the left over the next period of decades. Yeah, um, <clears throat> building a bench. That's one of the reasons why I started my show was because uh, in 2018 is when I got the idea to start my show. I saw. Um, the majority report interview Cynthia Nixon for governor. I saw the Young Turks interview some Senate candidate out in California. Um, you know, I saw them interviewing candidates in their areas that were progressive. And I remember watching, seeing, you know, progressive candidates running for city council and state house and even governor here in Oklahoma. And no one was covering them, um, yeah. you know, and I thought to myself, I'm like, okay, I think I could possibly do that. Yeah. Um, like, I know these people I'm talking about. Um, I have their numbers, friends with them on Facebook. I could contact them and yeah. get them on to interview them. And yeah. that's why I started my show. And, you know, um, and uh, I've interviewed people who have primaried, maybe not, they're, not, they're not socialists, but they're definitely someone who's on the left, people who are on the left. They've primaried uh, more moderate conservative Democrats who are in our state legislature. Um, I've interviewed people who are now sitting on city councils, either in Oklahoma City or in some of these other smaller cities in Oklahoma who were left-leading or who were even socialists, and now they sit on the city council. And yeah, um, that's it's something that a lot of people don't like thinking about 
and like i think on wikipedia this is where you can find uh all the dsa members or a list of dsa members who hold elected office yeah in state legislatures and city councils and i've looked at that list quite a bit and yeah have heard of some of the people you've talked about yeah it's like quite like a couple hundred you know people, if not like a hundred no, at least a hundred people, people something like it's that, a ton yeah. of people well i mean it's not many people yeah given the the number of offices that there are in america but yeah. when you but all of these people have outsized influence yeah so i was talking to um uh shama swat uh who uh on the seattle city council i was interviewing yeah her and she i was asking her you know how do you get stuff done when you're the only socialist on the on the city council and she said, well, you know, I'm very aggressive and I have a movement behind me and that we are able to exert pressure that forces these moderate Democrats who don't want, because of course, with, with her in power, Seattle was the first city to get a um, $15 minimum wage. And it's not a, it's not a coincidence that the first city to get $15 minimum wage was the first, was also the first place that had one of these socialist city council members. That was, that was the direct link between those things. And so she was talking about how even without the, and the Chicago, the socialists on the Chicago board of aldermen are also able to exert outsized influence. There's only six of them out of about 40, but um, they really drive the conversation. Everyone pays attention to the socialists. Um, and so, you know, even, and look at AOC, right? I mean, AOC is one person in Congress, but how much does AOC drive the conversation? Yeah. So much. I mean, you know, what other single first term or second term now, you know, l- l- Congress person has that much power? None, zero. Nobody has that, uh, the kind of power she has, even though like, She's one. So I mean, of course, that now there's, there's the squad, right? They're building, they're building up. Jamal Bowman's the DSA member, right? But uh, it's incredible how she's managed to win. I mean, and I mean, Chuck Schumer is terrified of her because yeah. he thinks he's he thinks she's going to run against him, and so he Chuck Schumer endorsed India Walton for the Buffalo uh, mayor's race, and he did that because Chuck Schumer needs to show that he's not the establishment. Uh, because he thinks if he's the establishment, then AOC is going to run against him and crush him. So, you know, even though we don't hold the New York State Senate seat that Chuck Schumer holds, we do hold the a position of power in AOC that is able to, where she is able to threaten Chuck Schumer. Um, and so that is power, you know, out of proportion to the number of offices you hold. And so, uh, no, we, we, we are in some ways in a good position. And if we could get 10 times as many people into office as we now have, we would be formidable. Yeah, I agree 100%. Uh, this is why, like, I tell people, like, I have some friends who are a little bit younger than me, but also some friends that are my age who are on the left. Like it's 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 not as bad as you as no. you think it is. Like we still have other offices that people could run for. Uh, when I meet people who tell me they want to run for office or say that they want to support someone running for office, I say support someone running for something lower on yeah. like like for school board or for city council yeah. or for state representative or something like that, or run for those seats or county commission. Uh, something of that nature because those are still important seats and even if those are not something you're that interested in building a bench for someone to be able to run for something higher that's where it starts that's where your Mm -hmm. influence starts that's where your power starts and then you can build from that because you're not just gonna get um like something like aoc uh getting elected to where she did like that's like amazing that was like a mm. one in a million thing like uh Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib they were state representatives in their legislatures for a few terms before they got to be congress people right but like for her to do what she did like that's like like almost impossible um but you know building up smaller and getting bigger is the way to do it and we're able to do that um mm-hmm. even in red states I always tell no. people that it's in red states, because some red state Democratic parties 
are in shambles and barely yeah. exist. Like oh, people yeah, complain, bad. like people complain uh, about like the New York State Democratic Party and how they're either incompetent or either like powerful against socialists or whatever. Um, I'm not gonna talk bad about my state party. My state party is okay, but like in some of these other red states, like yeah. There's no real infrastructure. I mean, even in Oklahoma, well, our county parties don't really exist either. But like, but, there's something that needs to be built that socialists and leftists could take over from. Like, uh, absolutely, the- no, that's right. Okay. And uh, and there's a big problem that uh, the Democrats have operated on this theory, this stupid theory that red states are inherently red. Like, there's something. There's something to the people in those states that makes them, you know, what they're like biologically Republicans, right? Yeah. Like as if as if this could never change, which is crazy. Um, and the, the a big problem is they give up uh, on places and they don't try it. They don't try and win because they assume they're going to lose, and then it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy where Republican rule is just consolidated. I wrote an article a couple of years ago about when I found out that there was a district in Georgia. Uh, I can't remember the number of the district, but um, it was a place where the Republicans had held the seat for for quite some time. But before that, it was a congressional seat. And before that, a Democrat had held the seat. But they had the Democratic Party had conceded this seat. They didn't challenge. They didn't contest the seat. And they in one election cycle, like 2018, a guy, well, the guy on the Democratic ticket was essentially a ghost. Like nobody could, the news media could not find this man. He, he spent nothing on his campaign. He said it was Rodney Stooksbury. And nobody even knew if Rodney Stooksbury existed. He was the Democrat. And he got like a huge percentage of the vote. Yeah. And it, it, it was very clear that he got like 40% of the vote without mm-hmm. campaigning. And he's yeah. the Democrat. And you think, well, okay, but... If that's what a, a corpse gets, like, what if you actually tried? Yeah. What if you really, what if you really tried to win this election? And you're, you're assuming that because a Republican has held the seat for so long, it can't be won. And that is just a self-fulfilling prophecy. You cannot give up on places, especially because even when you lose, you are building infrastructure for the next election. You are making all the connections. You are, um, you, you know, you're finding people. You're you're getting your name out there. You're you know plugging in with with groups that you can work with in the future. You know, yeah. it is really it is a long term project. And unless you start it now, then you're never going to wait. Yeah, maybe you'll lose this election, but you better be fighting every race. Don't give up. In Arkansas, was it Arkansas where was it? Uh, Tom Cotton didn't have a Democratic opponent. Yeah, yeah. Insane, insane. You don't run it. You know, Bill Clinton was the governor. They have had Democratic people. They've had statewide Democrats win, win office. You know, you don't run against <clears> this <throat> horrible, this horrible fascist Republican. You don't run anybody yeah. to call out his record. Um, I mean, that was just lunacy. And there's nobody steering the ship in the Democratic Party. So yeah, in red, so-called red states, we shouldn't even we shouldn't even use these terms. I mean, Obama was I didn't like his holder in a red states or blue states, but the United States. But you know, he you was right. Yeah. He, but I mean, he was wrong in what he meant by that. Yeah. But he is right in that you cannot just call places red states and just assume, oh, th- that's where the Republicans live. So we don't have to, we can never win there. We don't campaign there. We consider those people, you, you know, because the red, blue is all, every state is purple. There are no pure red states. Like even the reddest red states, it's like 65, 35 rather yeah. than, and he's like, but what about the 35? Who are those people? You're just going to abandon those people and treat them like they don't matter? Yeah. There are people, there are millions of people voting for your party <laughs> in these states that you consider just totally alien. Yeah. And like when it comes to states like Alabama, Mississippi, even Louisiana, uh, in Georgia, most notably, like those states are all like 30% to almost 40% black or black and Latino mix. Right. I don't understand how those are so red states. In well, Mississippi, Mississippi is a key yeah. example. Mississippi's like, are they the, the black population? Of it's like 35%. It's yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You're like, Mississippi's not a red state. You could win Mississippi, actually. Yeah. Um, 
you know, you don't think you go, we have a Democratic governor in Louisiana, right? Yep. Democrats won statewide in Louisiana. Twice. Um, he's, a, he's in his second term. If I'm he's going to say he got reelected, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Our social, our socialist agriculture commissioner candidate, Mar, uh, Margie Green, uh, she won 235,000 votes. She got uh, in the in the Democratic, uh, was, I forget whether it was one of these jungle primaries or whatever it was, but yeah. um but she won like a ton of votes statewide, even though she's a socialist yeah. um, in Louisiana. Uh, Georgia, of course, was a red state as long as I can remember. And of course, Georgia has, uh, you know, uh, uh, two Democratic senators and voted for Biden. Uh, Virginia, I remember, is a red state. Virginia is no longer a red state. Um, yeah. I hate, I you know, it, we look at Joe Manchin in West Virginia. We're like, ah, Joe Manchin is just a Republican. It's a red state. I, I'm sorry, but, you know, you know, Bernie won the West Virginia primary. Um, Bernie knows how to talk to West Virginians. Um, I can very much imagine that actually a, if you had the right sort of person come along in West Virginia, you could have a real strong Democrat win, win West Virginia. This, 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 you know, these, these are states, these red states are full of poor people. They're people Republicans fuck over all the time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> like we need to target these states. We need to be, we need to be on a mission to flip these states, all of them. Every single one. I mean, Oklahoma, my God, you know, you, you, you know, you have a huge native population. you got yeah. a lot. You get, you're, you're not a wealthy state. Um, you know, th- th- there should be a plan for how are we going to win back all of these states? Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, so like a fun thing I like telling people is that in uh, 2006, the Democratic candidate for governor, Brad Henry, also from Shawnee, he won... 66 percent of the vote and he won all 77 counties except for the three in the panhandle so we were talking about like a completely blue oklahoma for a gubernatorial race in 2006 that was that long ago that wasn't even 20 years ago i was in my lifetime um i was eight Yeah. yeah and and the fun the weird part about that is democrats lost seats in the state legislature whenever this happened but he won 66 percent of the vote uh completely demolished the republican candidate who yeah. was my congressman at the time i think is is took ernest is took i think it was his name did he get yeah. term limited out yeah he was term limited yeah. out right was but he would have gotten reelected, right in 2011 or 20 if he could have run 2010, 2010. uh probably because he was really popular even whenever he was yeah. about to get out um the person who ended up winning or the Democratic candidate who was the nominee in 2010, I think she's she still got over 40 percent of the vote, but she was the lieutenant governor, um, mm-hmm. so she got elected on her own right um, in 20, 2006. I think mm-hmm. yeah, 2006. No, 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 no. I don't know. She had a term or two as lieutenant governor, so she was, you know, someone who had also won a statewide race within recent memory. But that yeah. was the last. I want to say the last Democrat, maybe not the last Democrat to win a statewide race in Oklahoma, but the, like the last governor, to, Democratic governor to win a statewide race. But all the Democratic uh, candidates for governor, even since then, have at least gotten over 40% of the vote. Uh, and these are off your elections. We're talking about 2010, 2014, 2018. Um, 2018 was closer because well, the um democratic candidate was also attorney general for like four terms and, so yeah and this is especially impressive with i mean i don't know what the years as you said you know we we we, we won't criticize your state party um but um uh, in florida my home state for example um the state party really is one of these things that's totally in shambles now andrew mm-hmm. gillum nearly won yeah. the election against Ron DeSantis. Very frustrating election. And I was talking to people who've been working on the Andrew Gillum campaign. They said the Dem- Florida Democratic Party is just a total mess. They didn't know what they're doing. And yeah. it was a winnable election. Mm-hmm. So, and now we've got this horrible Trumpian Republican um, who is now associated with the politics of Florida, where Florida is this red state. Well, you know, it's not true. Andrew Gillum could have won that election. Yep. And, um, and so... You know, we really could have far more Democrats in office than we have if we had people who were worth voting for and we had party infrastructure that actually um, could get stuff done. Yeah. And, and it's and it's weird because like in Oklahoma, I'm willing to definitely cut my state party some slack because 
there isn't as much of a donor base uh sure. in terms of people there's not a lot of like actual people in the state but yeah. when it comes to states like texas or florida or pretty right. much most of these states that are like bigger states that definitely have more democrats than oklahoma and have more of a bigger donor base to choose from i don't get how those state parties aren't better at what they do like yeah it's just like is amazing to me that huh. it's just like they just drop the ball like yeah our state party does what it can but you know that's why i'm not willing to criticize them as much because sure, like, i yeah. know those people i know right. what they do could they right. be doing better sure but like they yeah, right. have so much to work with but like with texas like yeah come exactly. on now you're talking about 40 something percent of the state votes democrat in any given election and yeah. you have however many millions of people that live there and like yeah. there's way more to work with in a state like oklahoma or arkansas like it they have more like resources to deal with in order to get their stuff together but like i don't know it's like really mind-blowing to me like yeah that democrats across the board and all these states kind of just drop the ball i don't yeah. really there aren't many state parties or states to look at where it's like okay they know what they're doing i guess maybe yeah, no i know it's true it's true yeah like vermont i think is okay even though they have a republican governor but you know a republican governor in vermont is to the left of any democratic uh governor we would get in sure. <laughs> oklahoma <laughs> But, um, you know, like, I don't know. It's just interesting. Um, yeah. The final question I have is, what kind of music do you listen to? I listen to a lot of, uh, I listen to a lot of New Orleans music. I um, listen to a lot of uh, uh, Fats Domino and right. uh, Professor Longhair and Dr. John and such. Um Listen to a lot of um, old uh, British invasion stuff. I, I'm, I, I'm an oldies radio guy, so I like the old Motown. I like old um, uh, 60s British bands like the Kinks and the Zombies. I like, uh, uh, I like a lot of... Um, uh, like a lot of um what else, what else do i listen to yeah it's mostly it's mostly 60s stuff it's mostly the 60s hits uh that i that i have on on rotation um some subsequent stuff i like prince i listened to i read a whole article about prince um i like um i mean i like old like old country like 30s 40s 50s like the western swing stuff um some 20s and 30s jazz uh and and blues and um uh yeah but mostly mostly stuff from the mid mid 20th century um uh, that's interesting <laughs> um but yeah um so thank you so much for coming on um it means a lot uh, where can we find you on social media and where yeah. can we find current affairs current affairs is at current affairs.org and at patreon.com slash current affairs for our podcast i am at at nathan j robinson on twitter and i current affairs is also on twitter at current affairs cur affairs and also is on facebook if you just type in current affairs and then we have a Facebook discussion group called the Current Affairs Aviary, where fans of the magazine chit chat. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it. I also have some books out, um, and people can find them on NathanJRobinson.com. So that's all. I think that's all the promo stuff. It was great to meet you, and uh, great to talk to you.